All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Mike Brach. I'm a physical therapist uh, from Dallas, Texas, and I'm excited to speak with you today about exercise, a passion of mine, and how it helps people with MSA. Uh, and the big overarching theme that I hope you take from this is exercise is helpful for a lot of things. And the patients I've seen over the years with MSA do well when they loosely follow some of the principles that are common in exercise for Parkinson disease, uh, but where you don't necessarily feel like you need to overdo because we know energy conservation is a big deal. So that's what I hope you take away from it. Here's a little bit of my background. I'm a physical therapist. I also teach at a PT school here in Texas, uh, and I've got a practice that I know and love called Tribe Wellness, where we specialize in group programs for people with uh, various movement disorders. And we've got about 15 group classes a week. Many of them are in person. Uh, most of them are online. We do boxing. We do yoga. We do Tai Chi. We've got a balance and core group. We've got a hiking group where we go on walks. Some are advanced, some are simpler. Uh, and we do all this to try to help people boost their quality of life by getting as active as possible and staying as active as possible despite their diagnosis. And what's been really cool to come out of this also is some published research where we've been able to say, Here's some things we think are helpful from other research and from experience, and uh, we've been able to show how a lot of different types of exercise can help with balance. So I'm excited to, to get into this with you. Uh, my hope, too, is that you'll see when you look at these slides, there's a lot of information on them. We're not going to be bound to every word on the slide, but I tried to err on the side of giving you a little bit more info that you can come back to. My understanding is you'll have access to the slides. Um, and certainly, if I can be useful, hopefully you'll reach out and let me know. But uh, our big themes today, why should you exercise? What are some overall considerations in a program for somebody with MSA? And then what are some grassroots tips and tricks that might come from clinical experience or uh, from reports from patients I've worked with over the years, or from a wealth of research and resources uh, that I've gotten to you know, pour through, uh, some of which are, are courtesy of the, our, our host today. So uh, I always want to be an advocate also for physical therapy in general. I think anybody, as we age, should consider an annual tune-up with a physical therapist because physical therapists are movement experts. Uh, and I think anybody with a neurological disorder, especially a progressive one like MSA, uh, is hopefully in regular communication with a licensed physical therapist, uh, and hopefully one that specializes in helping people with neurological disorders, because there's some unique features to MSA that, uh, you know, just anybody off the street that might know exercise might not be as well versed in how to use this stuff to really make a difference. So why should you exercise? Well, the Mayo Clinic says that everybody should exercise because it helps control weight and it helps combat other conditions. Uh, we know that you want every system in your body to work as well as possible. I know with folks I've worked with in the past who have MSA, one of the main reasons besides feeling a little bit more loose and limber after a workout uh, is the mood improvement that can come. And that's true for everybody, but it sure is helpful if uh, one of the non-motor symptoms that comes with life with MSA can be uh, increased anxiety, depression, and feeling a little bit more stressed for very you know, understandable reasons. Um, it's, it sure helps to have a boost in mood from working out. And if energy conservation is an overall theme in daily life with MSA, it helps to know that when you exercise, and you probably already know this, but I, I believe in calling out the important stuff. When you exercise, every system in your body works more efficiently. 
And some of that is the aerobic training effect, where down to the cellular level, processes happen more efficiently from exercising consistently. Uh, but also, uh, it's helpful to know that the, the stronger you are, the less work it takes to, to do daily tasks. So it certainly makes sense, even though energy conservation is a big deal, it makes a whole lot of sense to still exercise, even for those reasons. And if you can sleep better, that's even better for brain health. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that I found, and the reason I call our group in Dallas Tribe Wellness, is it's so helpful to have a social uh, experience with exercise. It can be so much more fun. And it's really helpful to be able to spend some time with people who are going through something similar. So you can trade tips and uh, share a laugh and encourage each other. So for, for people with MSA, it's even more important to exercise. And we've talked about some of this, but the big deals are, obviously you're fighting stiffness that can cause contracture. The more you move, the easier it is to keep moving. We know that exercise may aid in slowing the progression of symptoms. And I want to be clear here, that's not to say that if you just work out like crazy, you can undo what's already been done. However, it's helpful to know that if you're more active, you have a chance of slowing those, the progression of symptoms. And also, I think the bigger deal is if you're more active, your quality of life right now in the present moment improves. Um, and, and so that, you know, that makes a big difference because that helps maximize function. And, uh, you know, we, we know that exercise can help with coordination. Uh, also, for folks that I've worked with in the clinic and in our group exercise programs uh, that have blood pressure problems, especially that dizziness when changing positions, that orthostatic hypotension, that drop in blood pressure, it makes a lot of sense to exercise to try to keep those uh, vessels throughout the body um, easier to manage. It keeps that smooth muscle tissue that surrounds your blood vessels more excitable, and, and it can really help with getting that blood flowing more easily and uh, managing blood pressure. But also, I think any exercise that helps you work on breathing deeply, uh, and promotes a sense of well-being is very helpful. And uh, we know that things are things are easier when you're taking action to feel stronger. And that also helps just with an overall better outlook for your day. And that's true with and without MSA. But it's just so important to get active and to do it consistently and safely. So we're going to head through some of these key considerations for an overall program. Earlier, I mentioned a lot of the principles that are common in uh, exercising with Parkinson disease can be helpful, and there are great resources out there. But if you're watching this webinar, you know MSA is not the same as Parkinson disease, and you know uh, that a lot of people talk about intensity. I think intensity can help at a moderate level. But if one of the things is you want to make sure you're not overdoing because we want to conserve energy, there's a fine line we're trying to walk here of exercising, being active, and not getting on top end intensity or into top end intensity. So what are the best types of exercise you could do? Well, I think there are three. One, the kind you do safely. Second, the kind you can do consistently because having a great workout every now and then isn't nearly as helpful as doing some exercise consistently every day. And that leads to point number three. It's got to be the kind you enjoy. Otherwise, it is really tough. And, uh, you know, I used to tour around the country doing a lot of amateur fighting before I was a physical therapist. I know the value of consistency. I also know there are times where I don't want to do it. And training solo is tough. Uh, and that's why it's so helpful and it's so much easier to enjoy uh, exercise if you can find a group. But I think it's helpful to vary things up because you end up doing different types of movements. If you do the same thing all the time, you get the same results, which might be helpful. But also, if you do the same thing, you're moving the same way. And if we're trying to fight rigidity and stiffness, perhaps um, 
tightness from dystonia throughout the body with exercise, especially in the neck and hands and arms. If we're trying to fight contractures uh, and if we're trying to work on balance and walking and strength, it helps to really vary your programming up. And that means also we've got to consider what symptoms you have individually and specifically when we try to figure out what's the best type of exercise. That's why it's tough to make a blanket recommendation because, you know, for some people, maybe their walking is just fine. And if that's the case, keep walking. For some people, if walking is a problem, well, maybe just a little bit of added support from a treadmill can be helpful. But treadmills can also get really dicey. Thank goodness there's an emergency stop clip, and I hope you use it. That's what I hope for people with and without MSA. Uh, but you know, also if you experience dizziness and that kind of thing, it still makes sense to exercise, but you got to consider safety and what those symptoms are in the mix. And that's when it might be best to have something where you've got some good support, like a seated form of exercise. Stationary bike is a great move. Or maybe you got people who can help you. I know we've done boxing research studies in the past. We've had patients with MSA come in and uh, having a punching bag that you can hang on to made all the world of difference for a couple of my good friends over the years in that, in that program. When we think about overall principles, large amplitude movements are a big deal, meaning it's so, it's so easy to fall into this pattern of leaning with small rapid movements. And the more you can slow things down and think about large amplitude, big reaching motions, big steps, picking the knees up high when you're doing things that involve standing up tall with support, things where you're moving on a larger scale of movement than you think you normally would, that really helps to keep your joints mobile. And I think if you can have a mix of some kind of aerobics where you get your heart rate up a little bit, and we'll talk about intensity in a moment, but some strength training, especially in the legs and hips, flexibility, stretching out those chronically tight areas like tight pec muscles, tight muscles in the hands and in the forearms and working on balance, things just go better. Um, and you know, it's not, not everybody loves this, but I think for folks who are dealing with symptoms from MSA, mindfulness-based exercises, you know, things like Tai Chi, yoga, dancing, and Pilates, first of all, they have kind of a, a meditative component, which can be very relaxing and can help remove a lot of the stress of everyday life, or at least give you a break from it. Uh, but also, you get a lot more flexibility. You boost connections in the brain for that intentional mindfulness focus of movement. Um, and if you think about shallow, rapid, short breaths being a problem, a lot of forms of mindfulness-based exercise really involve deep belly breathing, where you have that nice slow inhale through the nose for a three or a four count pulling the air down into your stomach and you have that nice smooth exhale, slow and steady for a four or five count. That alone can help remove the stress hormone cortisol, uh, but also that can help keep lung capacity um, much larger than if you weren't doing deep belly breathing. And also that can help with those moments of anxiety that may pop up. It can help promote mobility in the ribs and in the thoracic spine. And a lot of mindfulness-based exercises have an intensive focus on uh, posture. Throughout whatever form of exercise you use, I hope you manage your blood pressure well. And if we get into aerobics, I've got a lot of, a lot of types of exercise listed here. But my hope is you'll pick one that you feel safe with. You'll aim for 150 minutes a week and you'll go easy on yourself if you don't quite make it to 150 minutes a week because every day is different and that you'll focus on a moderate level of intensity. How can you do that? Well, you can always use a heart rate and there's a lot out there for calculating your heart rate, 
But I think this modified rating of perceived exertion scale is the key for managing intensity and trying to make sure you don't overdo it. Uh, and so if zero is like you woke up from a nap and 10 is your maximum race pace that you cannot maintain, I'm hopeful that during your exercise, you get to somewhere around a four out of 10 intensity and you, you hover around there, somewhere between a four out of 10 and a seven out of 10. That way, if you feel like you're fluttering above a seven, you can kind of back off a little bit and still keep moving. And that way, uh, there's a better chance you'll have energy for the rest of your day after your workout. For strength, I think functional is best. I love it when people do a lot of sit to stands and squatting, even if they need support. Uh, I think having strong hips and strong plantar flexors, think the calf muscles, like on that middle picture here on the right, this guy's doing heel raises. Uh, I, think, I think those are really helpful for general mobility. And I think for posture, um, you know, working on strengthening muscles deep in the neck, you know, by doing those chin tucks that you'll learn in physical therapy if you haven't already, and working on things like the lady in the bottom right picture here is working on bringing her shoulder blades in towards the spine and reaching the arms back. You may not need to do it on a stability ball like that. That's a little bit much for a lot of people. And you may not need to reach the wingspan back that she has. I'm a little concerned for her elbows in this position. But, but the idea is there. Big reaching motions where you're opening up the chest. I think if you can do that kind of thing and you want to add other stuff, great. But aim for two to three days a week for strength training and try to make them non-consecutive days. For stretching, I think everybody should stretch every day. I think that's true with and without MSA. Uh, I think uh, that you'll find there are certain types of exercise routines that promote more flexibility, though, like Tai Chi or yoga or Pilates or in physical therapy, people do the LSVT big program a lot for folks with movement disorders. Or there's another one called Power Moves, which is based more in treating people with Parkinson's, but has some fantastic principles that also apply to helping people with MSA live well. Or you could even, in the absence of that, just have a, a, a process of stretching where you know, you're know you getting in position, you're feeling that gentle to moderate stretch and tight muscle groups, and you're holding it. I've got some stretching um, key ideas and targets here. Uh, in the past, a lot of the folks I've worked with with MSA have really wanted to focus on stretching muscles in the hand, and you see some great stretches there on the top right of this screen. Uh, the calf muscle is often uh, really tight as well. I think people usually feel tightness in their pecs. They can stretch those out by opening up the chest like we saw earlier. Hamstrings, the back of the leg, like the lady at the bottom here, you don't need to go as deeply into a stretch as she does, but the general idea is wherever you're feeling tight, stretch it. Stretch it hopefully every day if it's a really tight muscle group. And hopefully you'll hold it. If you're doing static holds, hopefully you'll hold that stretch for 30 seconds or more. And hopefully you'll do that multiple times throughout the day because uh, time under tension is key for changing the length and tension relationship in tight muscles. For balance, there's so many ways to get after this. And I know uh, a lot of folks with MSA are in physical therapy and working on balance, but the big ideas are this, at least a couple days a week, and maybe you can integrate balance work into your other activities. And you want to try to get to a place where you're challenging your balance, but you're doing so safely, meaning you're in a target zone of discomfort where it feels, it doesn't feel like a gut busting workout where you're, you know, puffing for air and you're trying to uh, maintain your strength, hopefully balance feels like it's just uncomfortable, but still safe. And that could come from stepping in different directions to the sides, backwards. That could come from narrowing your base of support. It could come from slow weight shifting, but hopefully you've got a support surface available. 
Hopefully you've got somebody watching you and helping with your balance training and you can add coordination or rhythm or, or reaction training to that as long as you're doing it safely. So when we get into some really specific tips and tricks for balance um, and for overall programming, a lot of the stuff we've we've kind of talked about, but I think balance training with supervision is really helpful. It's hard to get, just like during the pandemic, we learned it's great to have telehealth for medicine. It's great to have telehealth compared to no other options for physical therapy, but people do a lot better in physical therapy when we can put a gate belt on them and when we can help them get to that point where they're challenging their balance, but they're you know, they still have someone there to help them for safety. Um, and in the absence of that, uh, maybe you can use some support surfaces uh, or work even on balance from a chair. You can work on balance in a chair by, you know, getting a little bit away from the back of the seat, tipping a little bit, but trying to stay on it and having, you know, something you can hang on to to stabilize if you need it. There are a lot of ways to do it. For standing balance, there's an app that I love that's available in multiple languages, and they don't even pay me to say this. I wish they did, but it's called Clock Yourself, and it's just a great resource because it can let you step out in different directions and progress your speed and give you some brain games. It's definitely worth checking out, and I think a timeless classic that I'm very biased to is Tai Chi because you get slow controlled weight shifting and then you challenge your balance by having certain eye movements by uh, going out beyond your base of support with your trunk by gaining the awareness of your posture um, coming up on one leg or trying to by tapping a foot if that's available to you and tai chi can be so easily modified for people at every possible level I've had students in Tai Chi who are in wheelchairs. I've had students in Tai Chi who can kick higher than I can and all kinds of things in between. This next slide is a big deal. And when we think about the autonomic nervous system, we know MSA provides a lot of challenges when it comes to autonomic regulation. So some people I've seen um, sweat like crazy because of their autonomic nervous system, and that's okay. Uh, some people don't sweat at all. Uh, also, the bigger issue of whether you're sweating or not is overheating. And hopefully for that, you, you're able to work out near a fan. Hopefully you're using that rating of perceived exertion scale I shared with you earlier, that zero to 10 intensity spectrum. Um, and it, even if you're not sweating, you might think, well, I don't need to hydrate as much. I don't need to drink a lot of water. I'm not sweating, but you can still get dehydrated without sweating. So I hope you're hydrating because hydrating also plays a major role in these blood pressure problems we've been talking about. Sugary drinks, oddly enough, don't really help. So if you can hydrate with water, that's helpful. And uh, if you have blood pressure problems in daily life and especially during exercise, Hopefully you'll take your time with those transitions. When you first get out of a chair, hopefully you'll stay there for a moment, see if you're getting lightheaded, make sure you got something to hang on to, and that way you can sit back down. Um, and hopefully you'll consider using something like compression stockings because it won't get rid of the blood pressure problem, but it sure can make a difference. For bowel and bladder control in daily life and in exercise especially, I always encourage people to dress for success, meaning um, there are, depends, adult diapers, support, there are all kinds of things available. And if you're worried that you're going to start working out and have an accident, it sure helps to be prepared. But also, I hope you know that you can do some pelvic floor exercises, things like Kegels or Kegels, depending on how you pronounce them. They can make a big difference. And there are pelvic floor therapists. And there are even forms of exercise that include pelvic floor contractions, contracting those same muscles you use when you have to hold it when you need to use the restroom. That's part of Tai Chi. That's part of yoga. It's part of Pilates. It's part of why I'm promoting mindfulness-based exercise. 
For muscle stiffness and contractures, the general theme is move as much as you can, as normally as you can at each joint. Uh, and, and we talked about stretching earlier, but stretching goes even better if you've done some aerobic exercise first, something that gets your heart rate up for, for even just a couple of minutes, because that delivers a lot more oxygen to your brain, makes your brain more excitable, which can have this downstream effect of reducing some of the dystonia or rigidity and stiffness, improving the blood flow throughout the body, which lets you get more out of your stretching. And for that jaw clenching, I don't know if, if you're watching this, I don't know if you have this issue, but I know some folks that I've worked with in the past have really had a lot of jaw clenching um, and one thing, another thing that's great about mindfulness-based exercises is, and for in tai, in tai Chi, for example, our base posture, Wu Chi, which means emptiness, we relax the jaw, we rest the tip of the tongue against the roof of the mouth, and keep, even if the lips are sealed, you keep the jaw slightly open. That alone can have a profound effect just thinking about it throughout the day and being mindful of it. But there's also a set of really commonly used physical therapy exercises called the Roccobato 6x6 six six that's usually used for temporomandibular dysfunction, TMJ issues that can be very helpful with a clenched jaw and can, can also help you out with reducing some of those headaches and neck issues that are related. For ataxia, which is another common issue folks have with MSA and we want to be mindful of with exercise. My experience is if you stabilize centrally, like your trunk or uh, close to the midline of your body, so things like this reverse uh, nimbo walker, uh, it's a lot easier to deal with that uh, lack of stability distally. The more stable you get. So what does that mean? Well, uh, in Tai Chi, I've had folks who do part of the class standing and part of the class seated. When they're standing, they might stand right next to a freestanding punching bag or a support surface that they can lean into and hang on to while still working on their footwork. And it makes it so much easier for them to step properly. Or in boxing, same thing. They've got something they can lean on get that central stability, it's easier to do effective punches and reach without as much ataxia coming into play. So uh, slow down and focus, that can be a big deal too. And my hope is that you'll give yourself permission to focus on the big picture of the motion because life can be stressful enough. If you get stressed out during exercise, uh, trying to do it perfectly, it often just ramps up symptoms, which brings us to another topic here of breathing. Those slow, deep diaphragmatic breaths, those deep belly breaths where you're using that diaphragm to expand your lungs makes such a difference for a lot of things. But also, even simple aerobic exercise can help with keeping fluid out of your lungs, and that can help keep your breathing well. Um, for diaphragmatic breathing, the, the main theme, or deep belly breathing, the main theme is to think of a lot of little bits of air, sipping the air rather than gulping it. So rather than, when, somebody, when I say take a deep breath, usually somebody goes, but a slow inhale where you're imagining pulling the air into your stomach and hips, and a slower exhale where it's just passively coming out makes such a big difference. For speech, hopefully you've got a speech language pathologist, but during your exercise, you can call out what you're doing with intent. You can count your repetitions loudly. You can use that as another opportunity to practice strengthening those muscles in the vocal cords that also help you to swallow better. You can speak loudly with anybody you're working out with. And just in case you're having trouble, my hope for safety is that you'll always have some sort of agreed upon hand gesture or sound that you can make. Even if you're having trouble speaking someday, uh, 
where you can let somebody know, I need to stop. Please bring a chair or have one ready. That's assuming you've got a workout buddy, but I think that makes such a big difference for safety. So hopefully you have an agreed upon way to signal, ah, if, I, if I'm out of breath or if I'm having trouble speaking, this is how I want you to know that I need your help to get to this chair um, or that I need to stop. Uh, and that way you, you're in good communication ahead of time on what to do and how to handle things. In summary, my hope is you'll stay as safe as possible. You'll be as consistent as possible and you'll try not to overdo it. Get out there and get active, but keep in mind that moderate level of intensity is the sweet spot for so many things to go well. And uh, rather than focusing on one individual performance, if you have a great day or a rough day, I'm hopeful you'll still find something you can do despite how you feel when it comes to exercise. Because as Jack LaLanne, the godfather of fitness once said, it's not what you do some of the time that counts. It's what you do all of the time that counts. And that consistency makes such a big difference in really doing well with this deal. Thank you from me and my dog, Boba. And if I can be helpful, here's my contact info. Hopefully you'll let me know. And I've got a bunch of references if you want to do some further digging. I sure appreciate your time today and letting me present. And uh, I hope you got some useful tips out of this. And I wish you well, getting active and staying active. Take care.